There we go. All right. So today we'll change the format of the class a little bit. I will first talk about the practice questions. And then if we have time left, you know, we can go to my Twitter site and talk about some of that stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can stay awake at least until that time. All right. <clears throat> Exam two questions. How many people got a chance to take a look at those questions and just work on it a little bit? Not too many? Uh, that's OK. We'll, we'll work on those today. From what I saw, it looked pretty easy. Sorry? From what I saw, it looked pretty easy. Well, you know, it's all about you know whether you can follow the flow of the program and do what you know, the machine would have done anyway. So none of it really should be, you know, it's not intended to be tricky. There's nothing I can ask that is tricky when it comes to tracing. Because all you have to do is to do the same thing as if the, you know, as the machine would have done, and you know there are only so many mechanisms you know we have talked about, and you just have to follow those mechanisms correctly. So we we'll go ahead and unzip this to today's folder. So this way, you know, when I upload today's folder, you know, we'll have all of all of these files uploaded as well. See, I can see my you know volume. You know, behind the uh, the main browser screen because it's transparent, so I think that's cool. <laughs> what application is that? Um, that's just XFCE4. You know, the Windows Manager of XFCE4 has a compositor, you know, which is the engine I had to turn on for transparency to work. that folder, open up, open office, and start working on it. Are there any questions before we get started? If there's a general question about a a concept with arrays, you know, we should you know deal with that first before we actually start to trace the program. Yep. When I have the transparency make it difficult to use two windows of uh, Office yep. Calc. Of Office Calc. Yeah, since I guess you we'll have two uh, different windows with one focus make transparency on the other window. You can control a lot of those attributes. So as we go through and we find it you know, annoying to have this turned on, you know, we can go ahead and turn some of that off. The, the active window is always opaque, you know, 100% opaque, until you press the Alt key and use your mouse at the title bar and use the scroll wheel to change its transparency. By default, you know, whatever is active, whichever one is your active window is always opaque. Yes, yeah, but since you have the two different windows when we trace, but in this case, you know, I just have to open up two different panes. Uh, you know, so it depends on whether you know this is enough space to do the whole thing or not. I think it is. It's a fairly simple algorithm. All right. So we will start with you know these questions. I'm only going to do one variant, you know, for each question because the other variants are very similar. So maybe one more if you guys have questions, you know, and want to just go through one more um, iteration. All right, so <clears throat> let's get started here. Um, the okay, so we I have to show the, the caption of the lines too, you know, just so that we know which one is, you know, where is our comments, the line number, i, x. We have two arrays in this case. The first one is array A, which has three elements. Yep. Do your top box a little too small? The top box. Row four? Yeah. No, line four. Rows. Oh, I see. Yeah, we just have to merge a few more columns, I guess. Yeah, I have to unmerge. 
merge it first before I merge again. Armor. Unmerge. Split. It's just off by a little bit. Oh, okay. I thought it was something else. That was like what I'll do is I'm just going to get rid of the grid. Go to borders, get rid of everything. Oh, talking about borders, uh, Barnes and Noble. Yep. Borders reminded me of bookstores, and the bookstores reminded me of Barnes and Nobles, and which <laughs> reminded me of the story that I was, you know, that I you know, actually wanted to share. They are. Uh, they are. They they ask the department Department of Justice to look into Microsoft's practice of using patents to stop Android devices from being sold or distributed and stuff like that. So that's uh, being done. I think that was Google's plan all along from the beginning, because Google decided not to confront Microsoft, you know, t from the beginning. And Microsoft did not attack Google directly. Microsoft never filed a lawsuit against Google on the use of Android and the patents involved. And instead, Microsoft you know, went to all the manufacturers of Android devices, tablets, cell phones, and whatnot, and just you know, say, hey, you're making a device that is infringing on our patents. Instead of you know, stopping you from selling that, those devices, how about this? You pay me five bucks for every device that you sell, okay? Smaller companies don't want to fight with Microsoft because it, a, sustain, a sustained legal battle you know, can take a lot of money. And many of these smaller companies don't have the capital to last that long you know, through the, the, the court case. So they just say, okay, fine, you know, we'll pay you five bucks. And Barnes and Nobles is the only, you know, Barnes and Noble is the first company who you know, you know, wanted to fight back and say, you know, hey, this is wrong. You know, we, we want the Department of Justice to step in and look at this practice and what, see whether it is um, you know, antitrust or not. And I think it's smart for Google to just kind of sit around and do nothing, because otherwise it would just be Google versus Microsoft. And when it comes to antitrust and stuff like that, you know, it can go both ways, right? <laughs> so we'll see what happens you know, with that. You know, it's just interesting. OK, digression finished. <clears throat> All right. So with this program, um, there, there are no subroutines. So for, the, for those of you who came in a little bit late, I'm not going to ask any subroutine qu questions for the second exam. So they will all be in the final exam. It's good and bad in a way. All right, so we will start with line one. Line one is fairly simple. All it does is to change variable x to zero. So we put a zero here. On line two, we want to put a zero into i. Line three is the first time we actually have to deal with arrays because we have to find out is i less than the number of elements in array A. i is zero, bar A bar is three, three, three. because we have three elements in A. So a, i is less than bar A bar is true. We go to line four, which is the inside of the subroutine. And in this case, we have to be, you know, we just have to do this do it step by step. There's nothing difficult about this. It's just you know you have to do it step by step. Yep. Question? No. Okay. Just adjusting your glasses. Okay. The first thing we have to do is to figure out what is this portion, the highlighted portion. It's bar a bar minus one minus i, because the whole thing is inside the square bracket. We have to evaluate that expression first. Go ahead. It's two. It is 2, exactly, because bar A bar is 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, I is 0, 2 minus 0 is 2. So this entire thing inside the square bracket is 2. And you take a step back a little bit, and then you say, okay, but what is A bracket 2? Well, A bracket 2, you can just look it up, it is column G, it has a value of 2. Okay. So 2 is the left-hand side of the multiplication. The right-hand side is a little bit easier. It is just b bracket i. i is 0, so we are referring to b bracket 0. b bracket 0 has a value of negative 2. We are multiplying 2 to negative 2, which will give you a result of negative 4. We are adding negative 4, negative 4 to x. x was 0 to begin with. 0 plus negative 4 
is negative 4, and now it has a value of negative 4. Then we move on to line 5. Line 5 is adding 1 to i. i goes from 0 to 1. We go back to line 3, which is the beginning of the loop. i is 1. 1 is less than bar a bar, which is 3, is yeah. still true. All right. We move on to line 4. So this time we have to figure out, OK, what are we adding? If you look at this, OK, let me just highlight the portion that I want you to look at first. And we can bump up the size a little bit so it's easier for you to read. OK, let's take a look at the highlighted portion. How do you think the expression inside the square bracket Okay, let's just focus on the part inside the square bracket. How does this value change as i increments? It just decrements, right? Exactly, because i is going up you know, one by one. It started with zero, and now it is one. This value, the value of the highlighted expression, will just go down by one. It was two before, this time it's one. On the other side, we have b bracket i. That one would just go up one by one. In other words, with array A, we start with the last element. With array B, we started off with the first element. But for each iteration, it will go back one for array A. It will go forward one for array B. So this time, we are computing the, the product of three from array A and negative two from array B. Um, three times negative two is negative six but we have to add that to whatever x has already, so the sum of those two will become negative 10. Are there any questions about this part? So the key is really just to do it step by step. Line five adds one to i, i, be, I becomes two, i which is two, oops, we have to go back to line three first. i which now has a value of two is less than bar a bar which is three is true. The, the last time this will be true. We go to line four. Line four is going to add the product of a bracket zero and b bracket two. It's negative one times three, which is negative three. But we are adding negative three to the content of x, and it is negative 10. So now we end up with negative 13. Then we go to line five. We add one to i. i goes from two to three. And then we go back to line three. I, which is three at this point, is less than bar a bar, which is also three, is false. And then we just get out, say post, and we are done. Are there any questions about the tracing of question number one? If anything, you know, the question usually, you know, from previous, from past experience, has to do with this part here. You just have to remember, because the entire expression is inside a square bracket, so you cannot do the indexing until this expression is resolved. Once it is resolved, <coughs> it will be a number. Then you use that number to control which part of array A you want to extract the value. Yep. Is this uh, basically the complexity of the test? We understand this About the same. pretty much. This is the actual, this is, these are actual questions from last semester. So we understand we're cool, basically. Should be. There's no guarantee. <laughs> right. Why right. MMV? What's that? Your mileage may vary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you know, this will be the approximately the complexity of your test as well. Okay. Okay. Any questions about this one? Shall I move on? I will save it under a different name so that you know that this one actually has the answer to it. So I'm going to rename this one as exam two, question one, answer. All right, let's start with the next one. Let's go to question number two. And let's get rid of this one. So these are all going to be traces? Hmm? They're all traces, traces. exactly. do the same trick, just expose enough from the first pane and then use the second pane. And it's doing the same thing, it's just missing a little bit of the line, so I, I'll just make it look a little ugly. <coughs> because now, you know, B bracket zero is too big. It just doesn't look pleasing to the eyes. 
All right. Before you start to trace the algorithm, the one thing you have to do first is to kind of scan through the algorithm and make sure that you don't have any big questions about each line. Because you don't want to spend the time to track it down and then at some point you go, oh, wait, you know, I don't understand what this part is doing. This one introduces something that is kind of strange. We have not talked about it specifically in the class, and yet it is here. What is strange about this algorithm? Multiplying no, seven. W gets true. I was going to say the, the value W is, is boolean. It's boolean, exactly. But if you, okay, remember. But have we talked about assignment statements? We talked about assignment statements. What do you do when you have an assignment statement? An assignment statement has mainly two parts: the left hand side and the right hand side. So what do you do when you have an assignment statement? Evaluate. Evaluate the right hand side. And then whatever value it gives you, you use it to update the left-hand side. So can we do something like that, like line one here? Yes. The right-hand side evaluates to what? One. True. No, true is true. We don't say that it is one. And the left-hand side is just a column. So we update the value of the column, which is W in this case, to be true. There's nothing different about line one than all of the other assignment statements that we have you know, encountered. Yep? Um, is it a typo that you went, there's no line 7? There's no line 7? I probably uh, took it out for some reason. Okay. <laughs> but the computer would just skip it if you didn't have a line number and go straight to 8, right? The computer doesn't care about line numbers. For the most part, it is only us who need the line number to refer to when we try to trace an algorithm. Yep. All right. So the line number is not really for the computer, it's actually for ourselves so that we can keep track of you know, which line is doing what. I was really kind of asking, that's not a trick or nothing or something? No, not, no it's not a trick. Okay. Besides, we don't track line 8 anyway, so you know, what line number line 8 gets you know, should not even appear in the trace. Oh, that's right. Right. So it's not that important. But if you want to fix it, you can put the 7 there. All right, so we start with line one. So as I said, you know, line one is just a, an assignment statement. Whatever the right-hand side is, we use it to update the left-hand side. If the right-hand side says you know, the value is true, then we just update the variable to say true. You can spell out true, or you, you can just type T, you know, both are acceptable. Line two, a regular assignment statement with integers, same thing. Line three, like that. Are there any questions at this point? No questions? There are no problems you know, in your mind about putting a Boolean value into a variable? It's the same thing. It, it really is the same mechanism. We go to line four. Now line four is a little bit tricky too. When you evaluate line four, you have to observe the rules of uh, short-circuited <coughs> evaluation. Because we talked about short-circuited evaluation, you have to evaluate from left to right. Okay, so in this case, you cannot just say, I'll start with the middle part of the conjunction. No, you have to start from left to right. And then you have to stop as soon as you can conclude what the entire expression is. In this case, it is a conjunction. So that means whenever you encounter the value of false, you should stop and just say, okay, we know regardless of the rest of the expression, the value is going to be false and there's no need to go any further. So go ahead and evaluate this, st starting with i is less than bar b bar. i has a value of 0. Bar b bar is 2, because there are two elements in b. So that is true. Okay, 0 is less than 2 is true. We cannot stop at this point. Let's look at the second one. i plus k is considered you know, one expression you know, for comparison. k is 2, i is 0. So 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 is less than 4 in this case because bar A bar is 4. There are 4 elements in A. It's true. So we know that this expression is true as well. We cannot stop at this point. So the last one is, oh, W. Can we use W in a conjunction? Yes. Why can we use W in a conjunction? Because it has a value that is Boolean. It has a value of true, <coughs> and true is something that can work with conjunction. 
And so because we know the first two components are true already, that W is also true, that means the entire thing is true. Okay. And I can adjust the column just a little bit so that we can see the whole thing. All right. Yep. So W is false, and then just the whole statement would be false. Correct. So now we move on to line five. Line five also looks kind of interesting because we have a comparison, we have a conjunction, and then we have an assignment statement. But it really doesn't have anything that we have not talked about. It's the combination of things that we have talked about already, but it's nothing new. I mean, we still do the same thing again and again. First of all, when you have to evaluate the right-hand side, the right-hand side says you, know, you have to first start with W. If W is false to begin with, you stop evaluating and stop right away. But since W is true, we have to evaluate the other part. The other part is comparing A bracket I plus K to B. Okay? So just like with the previous example, when you see a complex um, expression inside the square brackets, inside the square bracket, <coughs> you will have to evaluate the entire expression first. So this time we have to know what is the sum of I and K. I has a value of 0, K has a value of 2, I plus K is 2, and a bracket 2, in this case, has a value of what? 1. It has a value of 1. So now we have to compare the value of 1 to B bracket I. I has a value of 0, which means B bracket 0 has a value of 1. We're comparing 1 to 1. 1 equals 1 is true. W itself is true. True and true is true. In other words, when you look at this entire thing, the right-hand side of the assignment statement just simply evaluates to true. So we have to update W with that value. We say true here, and then we go to line 6. Line 6 is incrementing the value of I so that we can look at the next um, portion of the, of the two arrays in this case. Then we go back to line 4, and line 4 has to do this all evaluation all over again. I is now 1. 1 is less than 2 is true. The first component is true. We have to evaluate the second component. i is 1, k is 2, i plus k is 3. 3 is less than bar a bar, which is 4, is true. So the second component is true as well. w is also true, so the third component is true also. We have true and true and true. The whole thing is true. Then we have to go perform another iteration on line 5. Line 5, you know, is just doing the same thing as we did before. It is compare, first of all, you have to look at W. W is true, because otherwise we wouldn't be doing this iteration. If W becomes false, we wouldn't be getting into the loop at all. The second component is A bracket I plus K. In this case, I is 1, K is 2, so we are looking at A bracket 3. It has a value of 3. We compare that to B bracket I. I is 1, so we are looking at B bracket 1 which also has a value of 3. 3 equals 3 is true. So now we have true and true. The whole thing is true. So w, once again, is updated with a value of true. In this case, even though we are overwriting the value of true with true, you still have to make sure that you write this true here. Because it is important for you to denote when the assignment statement actually happens. Even though it's overwriting the value with the same value, you still have to indicate it in the trace. Um, we now increment i to 2. We go to line 4 again. i is now 2. Bar b bar is 2 as well. 2 is less than 2 is false. Okay, So we just say i is less than bar b bar is false. And then we stop because of short-circuited evaluation. So we have to stop here. And since the whole expression is false, we go to post because there are no, there's nothing after the loop. Are there any questions about this trace? Yep. What if you spell them all out? False and false and true is false. You can spell them out. You still have to tell me what is the answer. And you also have to use the short-circuited evaluation mechanism. In other words, you can spell out all the thing, everything that is true in a conjunction, but the moment you encounter a false, 
you have to stop right there. Yep. So at this point in the class, should we be using short circuit evaluation? Yes. For yep. And it's because you know that's also what C and most other programming languages will behave. And this class is about the understanding of what a program would actually do. Yep. Any questions? No questions? Okay. So let me save this one using a new name so that you can tell which one contains an answer. And we'll take a look at question number three. At this rate, at this rate, we'll talk about a lot of other stuff at the end of the class because we'll be done in no time. All right. Well, what does this look like to you? You're supposed to have read about it. That's why we have the notes. <laughs> I don't have to go through every line in the notes. I mean, you're supposed to read about it. The floor is the integer, the largest integer that is less than or equal to the thing inside the floor function. I think I mentioned that. No? No. Floor no? Is what? No. Exactly. Okay. So it's everything that's not well, first of all, let me show you where you can find it in the notes so that you can at least say it is not, it's not something that I invented, you know, just for the exam. The links are here. You're supposed to read everything that is linked from the site, okay? That's my assumption is that you guys will read it. So based on that assumption, <laughs> And I can just go to binary search, go to the algorithm, and line four, the explanation of line four contains the definition of the floor function. Okay, let's go through this a little bit, you know, just so that we know that you know we know where to find this. And as a reminder, now you know that you are supposed to read the notes too. <laughs> That actually explains a lot. All right, so let's make this the only frame. So we'll go ahead and say view <coughs> frame. Oh, it doesn't give me an option to just no, look at the frame. Chrome does not have that feature natively. Hmm? Chrome does not have that feature natively. <sighs> I'm so used to that in Firefox. That's okay. I suppose we can, nope, doesn't let me scroll that up either. Okay, let's take a look at line four. Line four looks like this. M gets the value of B <coughs> plus E on the top divided by two, and then there's the almost square bracket symbol. It's missing the top of the square bracket. That's the, that's the floor function, yep. So if X is three, the floor would be three or less? That's what you're saying? Okay, let's, let's take a look at that. Three, the floor of three is the largest integer that is less than or equal to three. So it'll be three or less. It'll be three itself. No, it's not less. Two is not the floor of three. Only oh. three is the floor the floor of three. So basically we have to round the number to the nearest right. integer. What is the floor of negative one point five? Negative one? Nope. Negative one. Two. Negative negative two, one. because it is the largest integer that is less than or equal to the number. Negative one is not less than or equal to negative 1.5. So it's so negative two that is the floor of negative 1.5. So always round or zero. No, always take a step down. <laughs> yeah. Toward zero. When it's positive, it goes to zero. When it's negative, it goes to zero. No, no. When, when it's negative, negative you go. You always go a step lower, not step towards lower, zero. Right, right. It's not okay. rounding. This is not rounding. This is. So if it was like three point nine, it would go down to three, right? Yes, three point nine goes to three. Negative three. The three point nine would negative go to four. negative four. Okay. So now we can take a look at the actual explanation of line four. The symbol. 
the, the floor symbol with X in it is called the, is called the floor of X. The floor of X is the largest integer that is less than or equal to X. In this context, we are simply truncating any fractional value because we are not dealing with negative values, so it's the same as truncation. Okay, so now you know that I can ask questions from the notes that I never mentioned in the class. <laughs> Or would you rather have me just read my notes in the class? No. <laughs> Even a Kindle can do that. Yes. Sometimes it's hard to understand when I read it, so I do. But that's why you bring it to the class and then say, "Well, I was reading these notes. You know, give me the URL to the page, and I don't understand what this part means." So you can definitely bring it to the class, and I can we can talk about it in the class. Yep. Is zero an integer? Zero is an integer, it yes. Integer. Zero, one, two, three, four, negative one, negative two, those are all integers. Okay. Yep. But they don't have an agreement on what is a counting number. Some systems you know, count zero as a counting number, and other systems do not count zero as a counting number. So that part is kind of, you know, iffy. All right, so now we... Now that we know what the floor function is, and we can actually see that this is almost like the binary search algorithm with something that's different. What is different about this compared to the binary search algorithm? We talked about the binary search algorithm, and the only difference is on line six and, and on line eight, they are different. On line six, we used to have B gets M minus one. And on line eight, we used to have E gets M plus one. So I just introduced a very simple mistake into the original binary search algorithm and say, well, would it even make any difference? You know, does it matter whether we have the, that minus one and that plus one here? So we'll go ahead and trace this algorithm to find out. Okay. Line one, simple stuff. You know, B gets a value of zero. Line two, simple stuff. E gets bar A bar. Bar A bar in this case is six. Six minus one is five. Fine, that's pretty easy. We don't track line three because line three really serves no purpose other than indicating the beginning of the loop. So we go to line four. Line four has to compute the floor of B plus E, the whole thing divided by two. Well, zero plus five is five. Five divided by two is 2.5. And the floor of 2.5 is 2, because we're just truncating. And then we put that into M. M gets a value of 2. <coughs> we go to line 5. Line 5 is comparing A bracket M. Since M is 2, we are looking at A bracket 2, which has a value of 8. And you can also see the array is not sorted. But remember, your exercise or your answer is not to tell me what is wrong. Your, question, your, your answer is just follow through the algorithm, execute it the way it's described here with the data in the array, the way it is you know, in, described in the trace, and you know, see what happens. <coughs> so on line five, we're going to compare A bracket M, which is eight, with K, which, is the which has a value of six. Eight, which is A bracket M, is less than six, which is K, is false. So we have to indicate the result of that comparison. A bracket M is less than K is false. Then we have no choice but to go to line seven to evaluate the other condition. K is less than A bracket M is true. To begin, we move on to line eight. Line eight is going to update E with the value of M. So E becomes two. We get out of the conditional statement. We go all the way to the end of the loop. A bracket M equals K is false. B has a value of zero and E has a value of two, so B is greater than E is false as well. So now we have false or false, and so the whole thing is false. What happens when your exit condition is false? Go back we have to go back. We have to go back to line four. Line four this time is adding zero to two, divide two by two, which is one, and then we take the floor of one. The floor of one is just one itself. So we move on to line five, we compare A bracket M, <coughs> which is A bracket one, 
a bracket 1 has a value of 4, k has a value of 6, 4 is less than 6 is true. We go to line 6 here. We update the value of b with m, so b is now changed to 1. Then we get out of the conditional statement, we get to line 10, we evaluate the exit condition. a bracket m equals k is false. b is 1, e is 2, 1 is greater than 2 is false. We have false or false, so the whole thing is false. We have to go back to line 4 again. Line 4 is going to compute this time. 1 plus 2, which is 3. 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. The floor of 1.5 is 1. So m is staying as a, has, a, as, has a value of 1 again. I think we are starting to see a pattern now. Okay? So we'll go ahead and finish this one iteration. We go to line 5 again. Line 5 is comparing a bracket m. Remember m is 1. So we are comparing a bracket 1 again to k, which is 6. So the result is going to be the same as last time, because we have done this already. Then we go to line 6. Line 6 is going to use the value of m to update b. b was 1 already, and yet we are going to update it with 1 again. Then we get out of the conditional statement. We go to line 10. And if you look at this line 10, if you look at row 28, when we evaluated row 28, the value of m is 1. The value of k never changes, so we know that when it's constant. And the value of b is what? 1. The value of e is 2. When we look at row 32, what has changed? Nothing. Nothing. So that is a good indication that we have a problem. Because if you go through an iteration and none of the variables that you use in the exit condition changes, that means very likely you, ha or you, are, you have an infinite loop. Because if you don't want to get into an infinite loop, something has to change with every iteration. And hopefully that change will you know, eventually get you <coughs> out of the loop. But if nothing changes in the loop, and this is completely deterministic, that means you know you are definitely in an infinite loop. Yep? Uh, the problem with the instructions, does it just say trace, or does it say find the problem by tracing? <coughs> it will be, at the beginning, the instruction for the entire test oh. will say, you know, if you think this is, you know, it will get into an infinite loop, you have to indicate that this, will, this is an infinite loop and indicate, just explain briefly why you think that is the case. Yep. So that, that's just makes sense. That's just the rule of thumb. If one iteration, nothing changes at all, that's just pretty much it. Yes. Well, at least for this class. Okay. Yep. Um, for number 11, it's like, um, is it not means like if the B is greater than E is true, that means not true would be false, right? Not true okay. is false. Okay. And if it, uh, if B the is not changing anymore, you can see that B will remain as 1 all the time. And E, it will remain as 2 you know, all the time. And as a result, B is greater than E, it will never become true. In fact, you know, the, the hint that this is an infinite loop is because nothing is changing. Or we're saying that if, if it was the line all the like say if it was Exactly. If, if I did not make this mistake, then eventually it will become true. They will you know, the, the B, which starts from the beginning, and E, which started from the end, because of the minus one and the plus one, eventually they have to overlap. There's no, there's no way to avoid that. Even if the array itself is not sorted, it will still end at some point. It, it can give you the wrong conclusion, but it will still end. It will still stop. And if it was um, false, <coughs> I would feel like not false. I don't know if that would happen. But can that be, is that true? Would that, would that become true if it said like not false? Like if it was false inside? Not false is that? true. Okay. Yes. Just make sure. Okay. Is everybody getting this one? You know why I know this is going to be an infinite going to be an infinite loop? Okay. So the indication is none of the variable is changing its value in in an iteration. So you take the, a snapshot of one iteration when you evaluate a condition. You know, you take a snapshot. You take a snapshot <coughs> of the next iteration. If you compare those two iterations and nothing has changed, 
that is a very good indication that you have an infinite. <coughs> now that is only true in this class and also in deterministic programs. And that's because no one in the background, you know, hidden from our view, is changing the values of k or the array a or b or e or m. Everything is deterministic. On the other hand, if your program is waiting for a click from the keyboard, okay, then it's no longer an infinite loop. You can have two iterations, and in both iterations, the system tells you, oh, no one has clicked on the keyboard. But it doesn't make it an infinite loop because what in the third iteration, between the second and the third iteration, someone can press the, one of the keys, which changes the state of the system. So that in the third iteration, when you ask the same question, did anyone press a button, it will answer true and then you can get out of the loop. So in those programs, the difference is it is not deterministic. Parts of the state of the system is determined by something that you cannot just trace the algorithm and find out. But for this class, and most for the most part in, CIS, in CISP360, things are very deterministic. So you can use this you know, kind of rule of thumb you know, most of the time. Question? So just like all the little arrays, if someone was adding information periodically, that's behind your back. To Basically, you know, they can they. If someone can do it, but not specify the logic in this algorithm, that you know that means you know this loop may exit at some point. But most programs are not like that. Only people who write operating systems and device drivers. Would have to that would have to deal with that kind of issue, and for the most part, you know, you need a lot of experience to deal with that sort of issues. What is it? But in the middle of a class, is kind of an issue. <laughs> Um, it might pick it up faintly. Actually, you know, the recorder is pretty good at you know picking up stuff. What is the occasion? It's the Marine Corps. It's like right on the other side. Veterans. It's right oh, okay. It's the veterans. Wow. Veterans Day. Yeah, yeah, Marine Corps. Yeah. Ah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I still think I have to continue with the class. So. <laughs> okay. So do we have any questions about this one? Nope. Okay, so let's go ahead and save this one. Oh, so that's where it's coming from because it's pretty hard for that kind of frequency to get through a wall. You know, it has to be, you know, through a gap. Okay. Because only lower frequencies can pass through, you know, concrete, get into a room. That was actually pretty good singing. Much better than Roseanne Barr. <laughs> I still remember that time, you know, when Roseanne Barr had to sing the national anthem in a, was it a baseball game? Yes. Oh, I mean, that was bad. Yes, I have it all in recording too. We'll send Bart in soon. <laughs> all right, this is our last one. So this one looks kind of complicated because you have, you know, we have a lot more statements inside the loop itself, which is kind of interesting. And so we'll go ahead and take a look at, you know, what this one is going to do. But one scan through first, okay? Just we we just kind of scan through the code and see if there's anything we haven't seen before. Okay, first line, pretty simple stuff. Line two, not too complicated. It's just that we're not comparing directly to bar a bar. Instead, we're comparing to bar a bar minus one. Um, the third line, you know, we're comparing two elements in the array. Doesn't seem too hard. Um, line four, assignment statement that has an array element on one side. Line five, we have array elements on both sides of the assignment operator. Line six, we have a, an element on the left-hand side. We're changing the one side of the, we're changing, we're
we're changing that element in the array, um, line H, increment I. So it, we shouldn't, you know, there's no trick in this one. We'll go ahead and start with line one. <coughs> line one initializes I to zero. Line two compares I, which has a value of zero at this point, with bar A bar minus one. Bar A bar is four, four minus one is three, zero is less than three is true. And we move on to line three. Line three evaluates another condition. This time we are comparing A bracket I. I is zero. We're comparing A bracket zero, which has a value of four. We're comparing that to A bracket I plus one. I plus one is zero plus one, which is one. So we are comparing A bracket zero to A bracket one. Four is greater than two is true. Are we doing okay? Then we have to go to line four because the condition of the conditional statement is true. We have to go to the then portion. On line four, it's not too complicated. We just have to update D with the T, excuse me, with the value of A bracket zero because I is zero. So we copy the value of four to T. We go to line five. Line five is copying the value of A bracket I plus one close bracket, which is A bracket one which is a value of two over to A bracket zero. And then on line six, we copy the value of T to A bracket I plus one. I is zero, I plus one is one. So we are updating the value of A bracket one with the value of T, which is four. And that's <coughs> the inside of the conditional statement. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't get that part. What? what? Um, which part? You, the part where you got the T and the, um, the line six. Row 21, are we referring to yeah. this row? Okay, when you look at the, um, the statement I'm executing, which is on line six, the right hand side is just T, so we are referring to this column, yeah. and it has a value of four. The right hand side evaluates to four. The left hand side is A bracket I plus one, but you have to evaluate I plus one as a whole, I is zero, zero plus one is one. So the whole thing inside the square bracket is one, which means the left-hand side really is referring to A bracket one in this case. A bracket one is column F, and that's why column F okay. gets the value of four. Okay. But when you look at this, what what did I just, what have I, what have I just done? Yep. Switch graph. Yep, we are swapping the values of those two. We are, swap, we are swapping the value of A bracket zero with the value of A bracket one. That's all, that's what we have done. Yep. Where do you come up with these little things? Like, do you, I mean, is there like a stock way to find them online or do you make them up yourself? Well, the swapping mechanism is a fairly standardized method, you know, right. so when you have written programs long enough, you know, you would figure out you know how to do this sort of thing. Right, right. Yep. So we now move on to line eight because you know after we complete the inside of the conditional statement, we can move on to line eight. Now this is the interesting this is the only part that I would even consider slightly tricky is you know there is one more thing to do after the conditional statement. So you just have to remember to look at the indentation and then look at oh that that's end if line seven is is end if but there's one more thing, line eight, that you have to perform before you get to end while. So you have to kind of pay attention to that sort of thing. But it was not intentional. It was, I did not try to make it uh, tricky intentionally like this. So on line eight, we are doing you know, simple stuff, just adding one to i. i goes from zero to one. We go back to the beginning of the loop, which is on line two. And we have to compare i, which is now one, with a bracket uh, bar a bar, which is four, four minus one is three, one is less than three is also true. Then we go to line three again. Line three, once again, is comparing a bracket i to the one after that, which is a bracket i plus one, the whole thing close bracket. And in this case, now this one you have to be careful because we have just updated the values of a bracket zero and a bracket one. So you have to use the current values of those elements for the comparison. I is one already, so A bracket I refers to A bracket one, which had a value of two, it is now four. We just updated that in the previous iteration. 
So you have to remember to do that. Remember to use the, the current value of each column. So now we're comparing four to three, because i is one, i plus one is two, so we're comparing to a bracket two. A bracket two has a value of three, we're comparing four to three. Four is greater than two, but excuse me, four is greater than three is true. So now we have to go through the whole exercise again. We go to line four. Line four is going to copy A bracket I to T. So T will be updated. And guess what it is going to be updated to? Uh, three. It's going to be updated to four. Because I is one, A bracket I is A bracket one. T is getting the value of A, T, uh, of A bracket one. And that's for it is just getting the value of four. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. Then we move on to line five. Line five is going to copy the value of a bracket i plus one. I is one already. One plus i one plus one is two. So we are copying the value of a bracket two to a bracket one. So a bracket one is updated with the value of three. We go to line six, which copies the value of t to a bracket i plus one. I is one, one plus one is two, so A bracket two is the one that gets updated with a value of four. And then we go to um, line eight, because we are done with the conditional statement. Line eight increments I by one, I goes from one to two. We have to go back to the beginning of the loop, which is on line two. I is two this time, two is less than three is true. We go to line three. Line three is evaluating is a bracket i. Remember, i is two this time, but a bracket two has just changed its value in the previous iteration. So you got to remember that we are comparing four to the next value and not three anymore. <coughs> it's comparing that to a bracket i plus one. I is now two. Two plus one is three. We are comparing a bracket two to a bracket three. In other words, we are comparing four. To five, because a bracket three has not changed yet. Four is greater than five is false, so we can skip around the entire conditional statement because I didn't specify what to do with the else. So we end up on line eight. We add one to i. I becomes three. We go back to line two. I is now three. Bar a bar minus one is three also. Three is less than three is false. We get out of the loop. Get the post, and we're all done. It's just tedious, you know, and you can certainly, you know, people can certainly make some, you know, simple mistakes like not yeah. realizing that line eight is after the conditional statement and stuff like that. But for the most part, it doesn't really involve any concept that is new or even tricky in this case. Any questions about this? No? No questions? All right. We'll go ahead and say I'll go ahead and save this one. It would answer as a part of the name, and that's it. I have just gone through all four sample questions, and these are not really just sample questions. They are not watered down. These are act the actual questions from last semester. Yep, go ahead. More or less, uh, how many questions are on the test? It'll be about the same, you know. So four questions. four questions or so, you know, because it takes time for you to you know actually track it down in do the computation and you know have to fill in the squares but it will be the same as this one if you print it out you know it will actually the squares will appear so you actually you only have to write within the tables that I have given you so for the most part it's not too complicated yep today? nope I did not bring a row sheet today because we are talking about the practice exam and so, you know, if people decide not to show up, you know, why not? <laughs> <laughs> if people want to shoot themselves in the foot, I'll give you a shotgun. <laughs> 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 Should have sent an email. <laughs> <laughs> why, have shotgun rental? <laughs> <laughs> and free rock salt, too. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't understand why people would miss classes, you know, especially when it's not for good reasons. There are reasons, you know, but sometimes, you know, we have to miss classes. 
but you know, without a good reason, you know, just oh, I don't feel like going to school today. You know, I just don't get it. All right. So are we good with the exam questions? Okay. So don't forget to read the notes. Okay. You know, because you know, I don't cover a hundred percent of everything in the notes itself. <coughs> um, I cover the most important parts of the notes in the class. Uh, but there are certain details that may be mentioned in the notes that I did not actually talk about in the class. Any questions at this point? Shall we go back to subroutines? Okay. So we'll go ahead and close this. And I did promise. Oh, did I change the? Oh, I changed the uh, transparency all the way. You, you have to roll that. Oh, I had to roll that. Exactly. <laughs> because I did it without holding the Alt key. If I use my scroll bar, scroll button, without using the Alt key, it just changes you know, the, uh, the roll up, roll down this, uh, this thing here. Okay. I did promise that I would go to my um, Twitter site. So we'll go to the Twitter site and take a look. So the Department of Justice. Is there anything new? Yes, today's the 10th, so everything from the 8th to here should be relatively new. Quad-core ARM processor in future tablets. That's interesting, because people would think, well, with a quad-core processor on my tablet, you know, I would need to make the tablet about this thick so that the battery will last you know, at least half a day. That's actually not the case. They found out that even with a quad-core, these tablets will still last you know, pretty much the same amount of time as the dual core or even the single core uh, tablets. The trick was this is actually not a quad core processor. It is, this is actually a quint core processor. It has five processors or penta core, if you will. Okay? And you would think, but with five cores instead of four, doesn't that mean it will even consume more energy? I mean, because you, you now have five processors, you know, doing things at the same time. Well, as it turns out, the fifth core, which is a hidden core, is a slow processor. So the slow processor will handle most of the things that you normally do. It's only when you need the extra cores that they will wake up and actually do the processing. But because there are four of them, they get things done really fast. So they just, bam, get, the, get things done, and then they go back to sleep. And then the fifth core, which is the slower one that is energy saving, will keep doing, will chuck along with everything else and keep doing all the other stuff. And that's how they can save power with a quad core uh, tablet. But you can still do a lot of things faster. You know, anything that requires you know, processing power, the quad core will kick in, get it done, and then go back to sleep. So that's that's their trick. It's actually a fifth. It's actually a, a five core processor, but the fifth one is quote unquote hidden. So that, that, would keep the heat, that would keep the heat down. Then, would it? Since they're not running all five at once. Sorry. The heat, like, is, I know, like a quad core is hot. So if you if it if the battery can last a long time, that means it's not going to run hot either, uh -huh. because most of the energy is actually wasted as heat with you know most processors. So if the process if the tablet is running relatively cool. That means the battery will last a long time because most of the energy is actually wasted on the heat itself and also the light output from the tablet. And that's why 7-inch tablets make sense because the energy saving from the screen alone is already significant compared to a 10-inch screen. And this part is, uh, I read about this you know, at uh, eWeek. You know about you know how you know uh, Lenovo is now teaming up with another company so they can encrypt the entire hard drive. You know, and it's kind of like a feature thing. But people in the Linux world has been doing that for years. You know, encrypting the entire hard drive. So it's nothing new in the Linux world. It is. It has always been there. Has always been free and always been a hassle because every time you start up your computer, you have to type your password. If you forget your password then your hard drive is useless. <laughs> the encryption is that good. It's not like, you know, well, maybe I, there's another way to get back in. No, there's no other way to get back in. <laughs> but the nice thing is if someone, you know, steals your computer, you know, then the hard drive is just a hard drive. They can always reformat the hard drive and use it as a regular hard drive. But the hard drive is what, $50, $60 these days? 
So, but the data on it can be far more valuable depending on you know what stuff is on it. And if you encrypt your entire hard drive, you know someone can steal your computer or extract the hard drive, but the data will still be safe. As long as uh, you're not logged in and have everything accessible. Correct. As long as you know they don't you know hack into your computer after you log in first, right? That is correct. Or install a keylogger. <laughs> Keyloggers are evil. <clears throat> but this is bootstrap stage, so most viruses you know don't even have a chance to run yet. So the keylogger almost have to be a hardware keylogger. Yep. That's what I was gonna ask. To do the keylogger, they'd have to get your computer when you're already logged in anyway. You can't. No, no. With a key log, with a hardware keylogger, hard they don't have software. to be. Yeah, with a software keylogger, it will only start to activate after the system bootstraps. You know, they may even get as as soon as possible as the bootloader. If they can change the bootloader, they can potentially, you know, get your encryption <coughs> password for the entire disk. Yep. What's considered a hardware keylogger? They okay. look like a little yeah. dongle thing. Like you know. Before, oh, so you mean like to plug it into the installer? Yes. Okay, I think. Now they can make devices very small now. You know, USB dongles can be very tiny. You know, just in terms <coughs> of physical size. So if they make it the same color as the keyboard connector itself, you know, sometimes it's hard to see. I mean, they can really have a little attachment on top of the USB connector to your keyboard and then plug the whole thing into the computer. You know, from a, from a glance, from a distance, most people cannot tell. They can make it, you know, so that it is, you know, that close and compact, um, so that you know, actually, un unless you pull it out and see if there's one more thing, you know, you can't tell. Yep. Why did you say that keyloggers are evil? Keyloggers are evil because you know they can log all the keyboard events, and so if someone wants to figure out your login oh. password and stuff like that, you know, the, the key a keylogger will do it. You can have all kinds of encryption and go through HTTPS and all the kinds of stuff to make sure to try to make your stuff secure. But if someone has a keylogger and they can lock every single key, that makes it you know kind of much less secure unless you have a. Um, how do you call those things? A little. Hmm? The fingerprint security thing. The fingerprint security thing is actually easy to defeat too. They can use a scotch tape to do it. Oh, the hack! You're talking about a certificate access card. Right. Yeah. The access card is the only thing that makes it difficult or almost impossible to crack because you know they need to have that device. Physical card. Physical card. Unless they have cracked the card and know you know they can predict the number in whatever time you know, in mm. the future. <coughs> And that's how they. That's why. That's why they. You know, they hacked into the RSA because you know they. Then they know the key to all those devices, and they can now use the key to predict at what time you know which number will be the actual you know number to type in. Is anybody yeah. to detect the keystroke logger through process processes running or? A hardware key logger has no sign. You cannot detect it. Software the only yeah. downside of a hardware key logger, or at least the ones that I know of, is you have to be physically there to retrieve the device. But that really does not have to be the case because the driver on the operating system side can actually inquire the USB dongle, you know, if you know someone can actually get that far, and then that can be transmitted by internet and you know just send back to mothership. <laughs> or you just uh, just transmit it uh, wirelessly. Within a radius of the of the yep. hardware. Yep, you can certainly do that too. Yep. What sort of search can you do, like to search for extraneous uh, hardwares that could have been on your computer, like the hardware list? Is there some way to run? In a Windows, scan you can go to uh, Control stuff? Panel and then go right. to Systems and then go to Device Manager and then look under your USB devices. Right. If there's a key logger that actually can, you can talk through USB to inquire, you know, the keystrokes already logged, it might show up there. <coughs> but if your computer is compromised, someone can also install a root kit to hide devices from your view, so it may or may not show up in that case. It could also just mimic itself as the other device with the same uh, manufacturer ID code and stuff. Right. But when, when the system inquires, you know, so, you know, in order for the driver to work, you know, for the, in order for the hacker to be able to retrieve that information remotely yeah. as a USB device, it has to show up somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. For the driver to be loaded. Yep. So you got to know the little numbers to all the things more or less. Hmm? 
you have to know the numbers to all the little uh, things that you know. All the numbers. Like USB port, blah 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 blah. You can take a snapshot, you know, before you know when when you know for sure the computer is secure. You can take a snapshot of everything, so that way you can compare that profile to your profile when you start up the computer when you are right. not sure whether something you know, funky has been going on. And I think there has been some research saying that if you put an iPhone, but it has to be an iPhone 4S close enough to the keyboard, they can more or less figure out what key you're typing from the vibration and the audio pickup. And look it up, look it up. You know, it's, it's, I'm not kidding. If you put an iPhone 4 running a certain <laughs> app next to the keyboard, it has to be pretty close. I think it has to be like within 12 or you know, 8 inches to 12 inches or something like that. But from the vibration that your iPhone can pick up in the audio, they can figure out you know, kind of which key is being pressed. Yeah, go ahead. I also uh, read about something a long time ago that they can use like some sort of external device and uh, read through a wall of the uh, electronic input of the keyboard so you can wirelessly uh, view the input. They're basically picking up the interference you know, on the USB cable and try to make sense out of that yeah. traffic. Right. Yep. Um, okay. uh, what about like boot time scans and stuff? Is there a reliable boot time scan to find out what you say about someone put a key, uh, key logger program? Yes, but you will have to use up. an operating system other than the one that may be compromised already. So you, you will have to use, a like, let's say, a live you know, uh, Linux distribution or something like that other than the operating system on the hard drive itself to do the scan because the operating system on the hard drive may be compromised already. So you cannot rely on that one to trust, to, to prove that itself is trustable. So that would be a use of the two terabyte external hard drive? Oh yeah, that's why I keep a bunch of those things around. <laughs> okay. so there you go, and then Barnes & Noble, we talked about that one already. So now I have, I kept my promise, and now we can move on. If you if you look at all the news you know these days, it's all about the cloud, tablets, security, and so on. You know, so those are the big topics. But you need to look a little bit further because you're not you know trying to find a job tomorrow. You're trying to find a job in you know a few years. Yep. Um, uh, Yahoo News went out. Um, I think it had like a thing about the gaming systems are going to the cloud. Mm-hmm. On Yahoo News, like Everything is going to the cloud. The NSA, the National Security Agency, is also thinking about moving many of their systems, you know, to the cloud, you know, just so that you know, they can, you know, they, they want to basically s make the s uh, surface area smaller. Okay, if you look at each system as you know a tiny little surface, when you have twenty thousand systems, you have a huge surface area, and if under the surface they're connected, then a hacker now has a really big area to attack, but after they penetrate the surface, they can now go inside and in the inside they're all connected. <laughs> so you want to make the exposure as small as possible so you can concentrate all the defense to, you know, like only a, a sm much smaller, you know, surface. And that's what the NSA is implying that they want to do is to make, you know, you make use of the cloud to consolidate, you know, a lot of the resources and the exposure to threats. All right, well, so there, we are now back to uh, local variables and parameters. We are pretty much done with local variables because we have, we have already traced a few algorithms that talk about, that use local variables. So now we are moving on to parameters. And we'll start with by value parameters. And I show you this just so that you know, you know where in the notes, you know, I'm getting this stuff here. And you should read ahead of me, and if you don't read ahead of me, you should at least read the notes after the class, just to make sure that you get you know, everything um, you know, all <coughs> handled. Are so we going to be going over classes? We class? are, it depends on whether we have time at the end of the semester. Uh, we may or may not have time for that. But classes are closely related to records that we will talk about. So we'll talk about records, and we'll talk about abstract data types, and then if we have time after that, we'll talk about classes. And I need to open up Calc. And we'll go
go ahead and try to you know, make an example using parameters. Okay. What a parameter is, is a way to talk to a subroutine. Okay. Most of the time, a subroutine needs to do something. Okay. I want to add these two numbers. I want to change this number to you know, something related to the other number. So when you need to pass information into a subroutine, you can use global variables. Now, why can't I use local variables to pass information into a subroutine? Because until the subroutine is executed, the variables don't exist. And when it starts to exist, what is the initial value of a local variable? It's unknown. It's unknown. Okay. So it's useless because you know the caller or the code that is invoking the subroutine has no control whatsoever over the initial value of local variables. And as such, they cannot be used. So the only way at this point to pass information into a subroutine is to use global variables. And global variables are evil. Okay? <laughs> They're evil not only because they can cause problems. Okay? If that is all they can do, you know, many things can cause problems. But most of the time we know, okay, these things are bad and don't do it. The problem with global variables is they are very tempting also. Okay? Because it's an easy way to get certain things done. Okay? Oh, this program just need to pass this information from this point blah, 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 to that point over there. I'll, I'll just make a new global variable as a flag so that one part of the program can set the global variable. The other part of the program can read the global variable and change its behavior. That's really easy instead of you know, using you know, the proper method. But the problem is when there are enough patches you know, doing this using global variables, your program becomes really hard to maintain. Because unless someone goes through the entire program to analyze how one single global variable is used by everything else, then the effect of changing one global variable can be very mysterious because you don't know which part of the program, it can be a, a million line program, is actually reading that one single global variable. Okay? So we don't want to use global variables because it doesn't really make it explicit. This part of the program wants to talk to that part of the program. It, it makes it very implicit. <clears throat> All right. So what we'll do is we'll continue with our factorial program. And this time we'll say, since we already know this is factorial, we'll just call it factorial. And we'll use by val, which means you know, by value. We can spell it out. And this is called a parameter. We'll call this parameter n. And we won't use a local variable anymore. We'll just have the, the rest of the algorithm do the same thing. If n is greater than 1, then we do one thing. We'll basically have to compute, um, we have to invoke factorial again. And this time we have something that's strange. We'll say n minus 1 goes to n. Okay. This is the first time we see you know, a representation, representation like this. And then we'll say r gets r plus, um, oh, no, r gets r times n, else, ah, can't spell it else r gets 1, and if n define sub. And then on the outside, we'll do something like this. We'll say um, n gets a value of, for this purpose, let's start with something simple. Okay, We'll just have n gets 1 first, and then we invoke, I take it back, we just say fact, invoke factorial 1 gets to specify the value of n. And fix the indentation. Make it a little bigger. That fix some more indentations. Give it line numbers. And then we'll trace it. Make sure we save it first too. Because if I have the program, if, if I have the file already saved, it will remind me to save it again when I close down, shut down the system. So we'll just call this um, iVal and start a new window to trace it.
Is the uh, transparency getting you guys? I mean, is it being distracting? Yes. Yes? <laughs> That's okay. I can turn it off. That turns off everything. One big switch. Global variable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have our usual comments, line number. And how many global variables do we have? In other words, I'm asking you how many names, how many of these, you know, N, R, and whatnot, is not declared as something? R, R. R is not declared. So R is our global variable. We still need one global variable, even though we are using parameters, because, you know, by value, it's only useful for passing information into a subroutine. It cannot be used to pass information out of a subroutine. So we are still lacking that one mechanism to completely get rid of uh, global variables. But we'll see, you know, just with this by val thing, you know, what, what is it, how is it going to help us? Um, line number three is we don't need to know anything about R. And then we'll start with um, line 10, because line 10 is the only line that is outside of the, the definition of a subroutine. Line 10 is a typical invoke statement, but is it really typical? It's not typical because this is the first time that we see something other than the name of the subroutine that we're invoking. Okay? What is that thing one goes to n is doing? Well, let's do everything that the subroutine has to do anyway. Well, every subroutine has to remember where to go back to, so we start with the return line number. In this case, it is just post because there's nothing after the invoke statement. And now we, I go to column E. Now I go to column E because I'm implying that I need to allocate a new column. Remember, what else do we need to allocate new columns for other than the return line number? Local variables. So in a way, parameters are kind of like local variables. You have to allocate a new column for each parameter when you invoke a subroutine. Okay. So from that perspective, parameters are very similar to local variables. So now I need to reserve one column for n because n is a parameter. Now if n was a local variable, what would I put here? Mark. It would be a question mark because local variables start with unknown values. A by value parameter is just like a local variable in many ways <coughs> except for one thing. The initial value of a by value parameter is determined by the invoke statement. In this case, the invoke statement on line 10, which is outside of the subroutine that I'm invoking, gets to decide the value, the initial value of n. And guess what the value is? From the notation, 1 goes to n. Yep. Uh, so in theory, you could uh, have another variable x or y or something. Oh, you can, you can mix and match. You can still have local variables in addition to parameters. But in this case, you know, I don't need any local variables. I mean, like let's say you had a global variable x, and you said x goes to n, so whatever the computer was working with at x at that point would okay. be the Okay, when you look at line 10, let me just highlight you know, this that portion here. This can be any expression. You can have 1 as a constant. You can have x, which is, sing which is a single variable. You can have an expression this long. Okay. It doesn't matter. You have to evaluate that entire expression first. Whatever value is the result of that expression goes to n as a parameter when you invoke the subroutine. Okay. So in this case, okay, I'll just kind of finish this you know, trace here because you know, the rest takes almost no time. By the time we get to inside the subroutine on line 3, we only have to evaluate n is greater than 1. n has a value of 1. 1 is greater than 1 is false. We go to the else. We go to line 7. Line 7 doesn't do much. All it does is, oops, I, okay. okay, line 7 doesn't do much. All it does is to change the value of r to 1. And that's line 7. Then we move on to line 9, which is the end of the subroutine. At the end of the subroutine, can anyone predict the, faith, uh, the, the fate of column E? It, it just gets destroyed, okay? Because it behaves just like a local variable with the only exception 
that its initial value is determined by the invoke statement itself. And that's how you pass information into a subroutine. So the rest is just really is simple because I have to just change all this stuff here. I mean, this part is you know really not. And we also have to use the return line number before it is destroyed to remember to remind us to go back to post. And now that we are continued with post, you know, we're done. Okay, so this is a very simple program to illustrate the use of by value parameters. Next time, when we come back on Tuesday, We'll use the same algorithm, except we'll start with n being 2, so that we'll have to go through the recursion. But the mechanism does not change. I'll see you on Tuesday. Don't forget to study over the weekend, and if you have questions about the, the material that I'll test you on, which are basically arrays, not, we won't test, we won't have any questions on subroutines. Bring it on Tuesday so we can talk about this. <coughs> Let's say, Thank you.